Our journey is finally at an end, and we return as conquering heroes. The world will finally know peace after the Demon King's defeat, and our decades-long mission will be remembered for the rest of time. Don't you agree, Fern? Was that Himmel? Oh, eh, it was fine, I guess. Kinda lame, actually. What do you mean, lame? I mean, we just went on a short trip. T ten years? Killed a guy and came back. Nothing special, really. We saved the whole world by slaying the Demon Lord! Yeah. And? You're <laughs> a big joke, Stupid. <laughs> Farron! Our journey was so traumatic that I became an alcoholic. You were an alcoholic before we started. The only difference is now your alcoholism is worse. Worse? Or better? Gather round, boys and girls, because Big Daddy Grimjack has got a story to tell. It's a tale of righting old wrongs, self-discovery, opening your mind to new experiences, and being a semi-immortal eccentric little elf. Today, we're taking a look at Soso no Firin, aka Firin Beyond Journey's End. The story of how a seemingly immortal elf came to terms with humanity, loss, and preserving cherished memories as the world changes around her. Our journey begins where most journeys don't. The very end! Fresh off slaying the dreaded Demon King, our party of four are on their way back to the royal capital after a 10-year journey, where they anticipate a hero's welcome. But who are these intrepid heroes, you ask? Well, there's the daring Himmel, a valiant yet self-obsessed swordsman who is the living embodiment of We Have Fire Emblem at Home. The priest Hider, whose profuse alcoholism and general douchebaggery should have gotten him kicked out of the clergy years ago. The dwarven warrior Isen, who, like all dwarves, is at least 75% beard. And finally, Firin, an elven mage who obviously took charisma as a dump stat and could beat you at Trivial Pursuit while unconscious. Being on the road for a decade means a lifetime of strong bonds and dirty little secrets have been formed between both humans and the dwarf. But not so much for our fun-sized Archmage. Firin is an elf, meaning she ages much slower than humans and even significantly slower than dwarves. A decade for her is basically no different than a single afternoon. So it's hardly a blip on the radar. I'm surprised she even knows the names of her party members, though there is a possibility that for the first four to five years, she didn't even bother with the formality and just called them by their job title, Goblin Slayer style. Upon their arrival in the city, they celebrate in the matter of Hyder's people, excessive liquor consumption, and then enjoy a specific meteor shower, which only occurs every 50 years. As per usual, Ferret isn't really that impressed and promises that when they next meet, they'll go somewhere else to get an even better view of the meteor shower. Wow, that meteor shower was incredible. What a way to end our adventure. Eh. Eh? Did you just say eh? I mean, as far as celestial events go, I've seen better. Nothing pleases you, does it? I know a much better spot to see the half-century meteor shower. Meet me back here in 50 years, and I'll show you a real meteor shower. 50 years? This is the fantasy equivalent to the 16th century. The fact we made it to our 20s is already a miracle. Oh, don't be a baby. But I guess you're only 20, so you can't help it, huh? You really don't know how humans work, do you? I just want to be home. It's where my stuff's at. Afterwards, they each go their own separate ways, with Firin returning to her arcane studies. NERD! Just as promised, after a 50-year hyperfixation session, Firin returns to the capital, not even looking a day older than when she was last there. Hang on, a female lead character not aging? Was this manga made by Capcom or something? Which strain of T-Virus did you get affected with, Firin? Tell me! The first one she meets up with is Himmel, who is now a frail old man. He's been enjoying a peaceful retirement for the most part, Though, he has been guarding a cursed dragon whore that emanates an eerie ore from the cupboard like an overdue blockbuster rental. <laughs> you think you feel old right now, Himmel? I just made a joke that 20% of the viewers won't even understand. What's a blockbuster, Green Jack? Is that from Roblox? Damn, you live like this? My house is nice, quiet, you. If anything, it's stinky because of this evil dragon horn you had me hold on to for five decades. You still have that piece of junk? I usually call it my treasured gift from a friend, but you know, hey, yeah, you know, keep diminishing my existence, why don't you? Can I have it if you're not doing anything with it? First you insulted and now you want it back. 
You're really the worst gift giver ever in history, man. I'm an elf. I'm pretty sure I predate human history. Uh, how long is this hike you're gonna make me go on? Only a week. You know, if you wanted to kill me, you could have at least made it quick. You know, here, let me go on the bed. You could just, you know, put, you know, pillow over. The, yep, there we go. And then, you know. Soon after, the remainder of their group arrives in town. Hyder has defied all odds by not only maintaining a functioning liver, but also ascending to the role of bishop. Which is a miracle in of itself. As for Eisen, he pretty much still looks like a hairy little guy. Good work, Eisen! You're making your dwarven ancestors proud! Farron announces the location of her perfect viewing place for the half-century meteor shower. They'll be able to see the spectacle clearly, but it so happens to be a week's journey on foot. So come on, all you super old elderly people! Let's go on a week's long hike! That's totally not going to set off the many difficult to pronounce health conditions you've collected over the years! You'll be fine! Tie on your walking boots and book it! When they arrive, it's everything Freeran promised. The group gets the privilege of seeing a once-in-a-lifetime event twice. And the breathtaking view is also breathtaking enough for Himmel to just up and die shortly after. Rip Himmel, your orderly should have stopped you. At his funeral, some of the mourners are a little offended by Firin's apparent lack of emotion. Wow, this is a lot of people. That's because Himmel was loved by many for the work he did in his life. He touched many people. Then why are they all sad? Because he's dead, Freerin. People are sad at funerals. And these people are sad that Himmel can't touch them anymore. Please shut up. I will when I'm dead. With this daunting and undeniable example of time's ceaseless flow, Farron is faced with a very hard truth for an elf. At last, it's beginning to dawn on her that she's wasted precious years and squandered friendships in a span of time that to her was a blink of an eye. It's too late to finally take an interest in Himmel's stories. It's too late to tell him how appreciated he was. And it's also too late to cancel that week-long nature excursion that probably killed the guy. Just say, The remaining trio departs once more. Only this time, Farron is going to study something different. She has resolved to understand the essence of humanity and life's fleeting nature. Then 20 more years go by. Damn it, Farron! Get the lead out! I can't say for sure that Farron cares any more than she did before, but now she at least decides to pay Hyder another visit, despite him being her least favorite. However, she first runs into a sassy child. Oh, a strange elf lady. What are you doing on my lawn? Hello, child. I seek a bewildered, drunk-looking, sad old man. Me? Eh? Who is a priest. Oh, you mean Father Dad? No, no, that's impossible. The man I'm looking for couldn't possibly have reproduced. He was simply awful, you see. He didn't have me, he took me. That's even worse. And very, very sad. Okay, it just might be the man I'm looking for. Sally Fair shows up when Hyder is deathbed adjacent. Because if this elf's sense of time was any worse, she'd be right twice a day. Hyder lives in a quiet cabin out in the woods, where he is accompanied by his disciple, Fern. He took her in when she was orphaned as a child, and one of his few genuine priestly duties has been taking care of her ever since. Hyder requests that Freerin takes Fern with her on her travels, to help teach her the ways of magic and become a mage in her own right. But Freerin ain't having it, though, because she knows that the roads are dangerous, and dragging a preteen along would just be a burden. Constant back talk, selfies every 20 minutes, and references to niche internet micro celebrities? Miss me with that shit, kid. So instead, Hyder asks Furwin to stick around for a while to translate an old grimoire that apparently holds the secret to immortality and revival. While Furwin's there, she can assist in Fern's training, which consists mostly of trying to shoot a boulder off a cliff. That's it. That's Hyder's great plan for spellcasting, sending the kid out in the woods to shoot rocks. You know, my dad did the same thing when I was little, except for when I came back home, he was long gone. I've never been able to go back to the quarry ever since without breaking down to tears. <laughs> Daddy, I shot all the rocks. I'm sorry. I should have shot you. It takes Farron six whole years to decode the book. And when she's finally done, Hyder collapses, suffering an accursed affliction known as old. As he lies on his deathbed, he reveals his dastardly plan. There never was an immortality spell in there. 
He just wanted to sell Fern with her love of books and being a nerd for long enough that Fern would no longer be a burden to take with her. And that right there is why you never trust a bishop. He just wasted six years of her life with a goddamn lie. Oh, he thinks he's so great with his fancy robes and his diagonal movements. If he wasn't about to croak, I would have rooked the C-aided the bastard myself. Freerin, I'm dying. I know. You've been dying for four years now. Yeah, yeah, but, but for realsies this time. Shame that crazed mage never figured out immortality. This book was basically a very fancy picture book. A bad one at that. It describes the pictures instead of showing them. Oh, I knew old Ewing never figured out immortality. What? How? He died! Fair. But my final trick has come to pass. Fern is now old enough for you to take her with you. Are you sure? I didn't stay here for very long. She can't be any older than 50. She's, uh, 107. I'm dying. Please take her. Also, before I die, spread the word of God. Who? Bleh. So now Fearin has inherited the responsibility of a teenage war orphan, whose greatest accomplishment is that she can shoot rocks. Well, at least the rock was really far away. That shows a dedication to, uh, um, well, well, at least the rock was really far away. Fearin, having just about as much understanding of humanity as a common toad, is not exactly a loving caretaker. She mostly takes her new charge around accepting mundane jobs. But as this is the adventurer's lifestyle, there are great rewards and treasures, which for Fearin comes in the form of shit kicker spells. Sure, don't help Fern with her college fund or a down payment on a house. Learn how to get rust off a statue and turn sweet grapes slightly sour. Tasks that could be accomplished with elbow grease and a lemon. You know, some people collect postcards, you know, and some collect, you know, shot glasses. Fearin though, she collects nearly useless magic. In a stroke of pure luck, the very next job is in Shit Kicker City from a herbalist who requests that they restore a rusted statue of Himmel. Ha! What a coincidence! <laughs> I don't suppose you have any grapes that need souring, do you? Fern wants to go a step further by surrounding the statue with Blue Moonweed, the local flower of Himmel's hometown. To conjure it, however, she must first track one down in real life so that she can learn about its properties. The search begins and continues, and drags on, to the point where six months pass. Farron, come on! You just learned how quick humans reach their expiration date. Don't milk it just cause Fern is a kid. Fern is understandably growing a bit anxious, knowing that she just wasted half a year of her youth looking for an exceptionally blue flower. If things don't pick up, she'll be just as old as Granny before they flower up this field. I don't know, it's just, feels like Miss Farron doesn't have a great sense of urgency. Well, you know how our soul folks are. We handle everything at our own pace. Wait, old? How old is she? Well, I mean, she is the Freeran of the Heroes Party. They passed through here when I was a little girl. Oh, she doesn't look like she's aged a day. She... she doesn't, huh? Why, if Freerin takes as long as she wants, you might be as old as me by the time you finish this quest. Eh? But that sounds nice, doesn't it? Don't you want all of the wisdom that comes with being this old? Sure, you're on death's door, but that just means you got a new neighbor. Join us. You want to speed things up? I want to speed things up. All right, fine, jeez. Herb Nana provides them with some flower seeds that could prove a suitable substitute, as well as a reasonable corner to cut, mercifully allowing Fern and Fearin to pass to the next leg of their journey. Whew! All's well that ends well, I guess. <laughs> but what's this? The precious seed was snatched up by a squirrel, aka Filthy Seed Rat, aka my nickname in college! That wasn't my nickname in college. Is, is people been saying this? Stop spreading these slanderous lies! They take chase of the dastardly rodent, and lo and behold, it takes them to an area where blue moonweed is in full bloom. The moral of this story is probably supposed to be something about fate always leads the way, or doing things the right way, not the easy way. But it could just easily be, if you're getting impatient, bitch and moan at an old woman until she gives you some seeds of convenience. Probably that one, maybe. I don't know.
With the monument restored to its former glory and surrounded by blue moonweed, Firin has paid fitting tribute to her old comrade. At least until a hummingbird is attracted by all those flowers and starts pooping all over Himmel's face. Their travels next take them to a seaside trading town, where Farin requests Fern to gather some supplies while she goes out to run some errands. Apparently, the elf has a tendency to go out and spend their money on stupid shit, like animal skeletons or suspicious potions. So Fern follows in secret, watching on as Farin buys some kind of shiny hair accessory, before asking for directions to the nearest candy store. This is what I'd assume it'd be like stalking a Kardashian. So do you want to explain why I caught you doing so many sneaky things? Like asking street thugs for candy and where the closest jewelry store was? Wow, you're pretty dense. I was obviously shopping for your birthday present. Wow, it's amazing! Thank you, Miss Perrin. Sorry I assumed you were a criminal. Meh, it happens. Besides, you're only 108 once. Miss Farron, I'm 16. You're what? That evening, they go out for dinner, and Farron reveals that the accessory was a present for Fern's birthday. Fern is quite happy to receive it. Though, if I was in her position, I'd feel like it's more of a token of how Farron wasted a year of my life. Either way, it's a lovely little moment, revealing that bit by bit, Farron is starting to take notice of people around her. She's remembering details like Fern's birthday, or the flower of Himmel's hometown or how much of a stupid drunk-ass loser Hyder was. Aww. Luckily, right after that, they're off to a real adventure against Mortos Dare Soul Stealer, I mean, Qual, a bona fide demon, and one of the old world's foremost mages. This bad mamma jamma was sealed in a fancy prison designed by Firin herself, one that would last for 80 years to the day. And ever the punctual Archmage, Firin and Fern show up right on time to incur his horrific wrath. You see, back in the day, this guy was seriously bad news. Qual created a wicked spell known as Soul Track. Don't let the fact that it sounds like a disco mixtape fool you. It's so powerful that a direct hit kills its victim instantly. And as such, Soul Track led to the deaths of 40% of adventurers and 70% of the sorcerers in the region Qual occupied. Gathering their courage, the mages released the seal, unleashing Qual on an unsuspecting world. He recognizes Firin instantly and asks for an update on the situation. You know, like, how's things? Is the Demon Lord still alive? Have the Falcons won a Super Bowl yet? You know, the usual stuff you'd want to know when you've been frozen for decades. Oh, oh my lungs! Breathing air again! What year is it? You were sealed for 77 years. I experienced everything while I was sealed away. Do you have any idea how disrespectful people are to you when they think you're a statue? Do you know how much I hate birds now? Well, I'll show them. I'll show those birds! I still have my death magic! About that. Die. Wait, how'd you get up there? Ah! Dang, Miss Brynn, you really killed him with his own technique. I know he's a demon, but was that really necessary? I always do demons dirty. In front of their moms, if I can. The pleasantries are short-lived, however, when Qual looks to murderate them all with Soul Track. Fern puts up her shield, but is shocked to find that this legendary killing spell is actually kind of mid. Apparently, in the time since he's been sealed, humans have reverse-engineered his super-powerful spell, reducing it to basic unnamed attack magic. Because of this, basic unnamed defense magic can completely stop the blast right in its Soul Tracks. To add insult to injury, as well as adding even more injuries, Farron uses Soul Track right back at Qual, who in the 80 years he's been sealed, hasn't learned the counter to his own powerful spell. This absolutely wrecks the poor dude in the blink of an eye, and solidifies that Farron might not be great at waking up early, or taking care of herself, or identifying mimics, but she can slap box the shit out of you in magic. The village rejoices as Farron reminisces, as it turns out that Giga Chat Himmel came by once a year after sealing Qual just to make sure the village was okay, and lay some smack down if it looked like Qual's stony ass was about to wake up. You know, normally I hate flashbacks, but Farron just incorporates them so well, I just can't stay mad at it. I like it! Flashback to me liking it! I like it! Next up, their travels take them to another seaside village. This one filled with ship wreckage. Neat. Well, that was a fun stop. Time to get going. Oh, wait. Ferris saw a nice sunrise here like 60 years ago with Himmel? Oh, boy. Get ready, Fern. That's gonna be another half a year of your life down the drain. 
The two clean up the entire coastline, then watch a pretty, pretty sunset. If Mr. Miyagi saw how slow Farron taught, he'd be shaking in his beige tracksuit. After all that work, Farron even thinks the sunrise is mid. Mid! She's about to head back to the inn and pass out when she sees how breathtaking the sunrise is to Fern. Farron stays to watch the full sunrise at this, showing growth by further seeing the beauty of the world through the joy of her loved ones. And also because it's a nice sunrise! The animators worked hard on that, Farron, you thousand-year-old short stack! With the beach clean and the majesty of nature taken in, it's time for Aizen's once-every-30-year checkup. The duo finds him in a cheery mood, praying by the gravestones of his ancestors. It's a... it's probably a dwarven pastime. Aizen, I see you're still alive. Really, Freeran? In front of my dead parents? Don't worry, they can't hear me. They're dead. So, oh, what do you want? Just to check up on you. See if you need anything. See if you died. Are you expecting something, Freeran? Eventually. What a lovely home you have, Mr. Ison. I see someone taught you manners. I can assure you it wasn't me. It was Mr. Heiter. I can assure you it wasn't him either. After a light fireside chat, Eisen proclaims dwarvingly that he has a quest for Firin and Fern. Locate the lost tome of Flam, the legendary mage. Whilst Firin is a bit hesitant, knowing that almost all surviving writings of the late Flam are forgeries or reproductions, she still tags along to fulfill Eisen's dying wish. He's not actually dying, but when you're Firin, a brisk afternoon stroll could result in a quarter of your loved ones passing away. Like that one really frustrating time skip in Fable 3. Oh, yeah, spoiled by me saying that. <laughs> uh, look at the clock, it's been 13 years since that game's been out! After a few days of traveling in, Aizen reveals that the content of Flam's notes describes her conversing with the dead, something Aizen feels might interest Firin, since, you know, two of her best friends are dead and she regrets not knowing them better, and her third friend right in front of her is not long for this world. Hell, in Firin's eyes, Fern is probably on death's door. Firin is hesitant for some reason, but still proceeds to the quest location, and a large tree protected by an ancient barrier. I guess even max level characters still want quest XP or something? At the foot of the great tree, Firin states that even a thousand years later, she's still dancing in the palm of her master's hand. Who is her master, you ask? Why, none other than Flam the Legendary Mage! <laughs> Kill the flashback! Firin. I predict that in 1,000 years, you'll return to this tree and learn a lesson about the value of life. What makes you say that? Because you're you. Despite living for centuries, you don't really care for those around you. I still don't understand, but the way you said it makes me feel like it's supposed to be alarming. Don't worry. You'll care someday. Like to check on this tree, because I planted it. I still don't get what's so important about a dumb tree. Aww. But you're so cute when you're clueless and dumb. And you're so pretty. I told you to stop doing that. And I didn't listen. Back to the present day, Farron opens the tree and finds her second favorite thing, a book. Inside this book, Flam writes about a place on the topmost part of the Northern continent. A place that the people call heaven. Areola, I mean, <laughs> Areole, where souls rest. This discovery will propel research on souls forward. Farron isn't sure about whether this place is real, until Aizen reminds her that Hyder was a literal magic priest empowered by the very magic of God. So, half his existence is a little probable. This on the ass end of episode 4 of the show is where the plot is introduced. Farron must find Ariole and speak to Himmel. Conveniently enough, this journey will also take Farron on the same path the group took to defeat the Demon King and the road ahead will be paved with the memories of Heider, Eisen, and Himmel. Eisen doesn't agree to join him on this journey, as this is Firin's quest, but he does say that the two should look after his apprentice if they ever run into him. The two then shuffle off to a lovely forest filled with shadows of their loved ones. Loved ones like Heider for Fern and Himmel for Firin. Fern, my darling girl! I always knew you'd grow up big and strong, and I said I'd haunt you if you were good! Fern, don't listen to him. He's not real. He's playing tricks on you. No, I'm not. Fern was good. Now I'm hunting her. Miss Freeran, his rebuttals are too sharp and lame not to be him. Oh, for the love of... Hey. 
Milady. Sup? Oh, my freaking eyes! You're not Father Dad, are you? Hmm. And now I think I'm emotionally scarred. Meh, you'll get over it. After blasting the ghost back into the Shadow Realm, the two happen to bump into an adventurer's wet dream. None other than a fearsome solar dragon. The beast is guarding a hoard of treasure, including gold, jewels, and most importantly, shit kicker magic. Fearin can't possibly resist the siren's song, and instructs Fern to start blasting with some soul track. The party quickly realizes, however, that the dragon's scales make it almost immune to magic. So it's a bit of a close call for Farron and Fern alone. The two must recruit another. The recently foreshadowed Stark must join their team. The town Stark is in is super peaceful, despite the dragon's adjacency. And the peace makes Farron comfortable enough to spill the beans on what magic the dragon has. A spell that lets you see through clothes. Are we sure this isn't an isekai? Cause that seems like the kind of spell an isekai protagonist might learn. This bit is cut mercifully short when a very kind granny invites the two to meet Stark in person. Both saving time for them having to look for him, as well as sparing Fern from hearing her master justifying the tactical use of the see-through close spell. Grandma reveals that three years ago, the very same dragon that bodied Fern attacked the village. Just as Grandma was about to get run over by the force of a hundred reindeer, Stark appeared, and his menacing aura made the dragon retreat without a single blow. Damn, dude! And I thought King from One Punch Man had plot armor! This not only saved Grandma's life, but also the animation budget, so episode 6 can look so good. Oh, we'll get there in a second, be patient. Granny delivers the two to Stark, who is standing in front of some kind of weird quarry, I think. He starts by chiding the two for poking the dragon, but then changes his tune when he realizes he's in front of THE Fearin, THE Mage. He calls off his attack granny, and the three hash out the details of his recruitment. Stark, your master, aka my former adventuring companion, sent me to recruit you as our frontliner. You can start by fighting a dragon with us. A dragon? Starting off a little big, aren't we? Maybe so, but your master spoke very highly of you. You must go to Rigo Canyon and recruit the scruffiest man there. For you see, he is none other than my apprentice. Oh, well if you taught him, he must be a great warrior. Stark is disheveled, smelly, Homeless, and above all, cowardly. But can he fight, though? We fought verbally before he left. I feel like you're avoiding the question intentionally. Look, he's a red-haired Bishonin with a fat axe. Is that enough for you? Eh, worst case scenario, he dies quickly and we use his body as a distraction to get away. It's all I ask. And how exactly was that supposed to convince me to join you? Didn't it? Next time, Master, let me do the talking. Possibly due to their Nat 1 persuasion check, Stark has reservations about joining the group and even bigger reservations about fighting the dragon, as he's had trouble slaying it alone. Farron asks only that he keeps it distracted for 30 seconds, as she can surely kill it with an advanced spell by then. Just try not to special beam can of the poor guy, okay? I don't think they have Dragon Balls in this universe. At this, Stark has a full-blown meltdown, revealing that he has absolutely zero experience in slaying monsters. Sure enough, that menacing aura that scared the dragon was Stark's very own King Engine, complete with pants shitting terror. After the dragon flew away, the village started treating Stark as a hero, with free food and rent and all of his heart's desire for three years. As long as he protected the town. What a load of crap. How is this guy gonna protect anything? Wait, what's that sound? It sounds like Roaring Thunder meeting a crashing tidal wave? Could it be fireworks? A baby gender reveal gone wrong? Oh, oh no, it's motherfucking Stark! Turns out that quarry was probably just what Aizen led Stark to believe mining looked like, because each of Stark's catastrophic blows pound out new layers of Earth. Minecraft Steve, eat your heart out! So this massive crater was from your training. I did kind of think it looked axe shaped when I saw it earlier. No? Maybe? Either way, I'm not strong like you guys think I am. I'm only excavating a cliff face by swinging my axe with enough force to cause nuclear fission. Explain again how that makes you weak. Well, my master could swing his axe with enough force to cause nuclear fusion, which is way cooler. I mean, you're right. But Miss Farron and I can't do either of those things, so that makes you strong. 
fight the dragon with us. No! What if mid-swing a bird poops in my eye, then later it gets infected, then in five to ten years I lose that eye? I would have to wear an eye patch! So are you afraid of the dragon, the bird, or the eye patch? All of them! Do you have any idea how annoying and unfashionable eye patches are? I can see something else that's annoying. What? Where? Get it away from me! Fern arrives to marvel at Stark's strength, only to wind up giving him a pep talk. Stark thinks the dragon has only spared the town on a whim, not because he's actually done anything. Fern describes a time in which she fought a monster and needed only resolve to defeat it. As a viewer of this scene, I agree, because it's definitely not the animation that needs any higher resolution. <laughs> like, god damn, look at those frames! <laughs> Fern says she believes that Stark will show up the next morning to fight the dragon with Farron and Fern by his side. Come the next morning, three out of four of those things are there. The dragon and Fern are there, and even Farron has gotten up early, but Stark is nowhere to be found. Fern promptly lashes herself to a tree in protest of fighting the dragon alone. And luckily, before Farron can pry her off, Stark's resolve has finally manifested, and him along with it. He agrees to tank the dragon without a healer for 30 seconds as long as they can land the killing blow. The gang all agrees, and what follows is some of the best animation this season. And I'm counting Jujutsu Kaisen! Holy crap, the animation studio said rent was due! Farron had four episodes of melancholy malaise, only to come in guns blazing with episode five and six. This is some shonen action level badassery, and to prove it, before 30 seconds have even passed, the dragon is completely soloed by Stark. Tank diff dragon, tank diff. To the victors go the spoils, and Stark, Farron, and Fern are quick to loot the horde. Farron gets her book of spell and the party gets a load of much-needed traveling funds as the trio begins to head out on their next adventure. Stark says his goodbye to the villagers, and Farron allows a curious tween to learn the see-through clothes magic. That will possibly go wrong. And she used it to look at Farron's naked body. And she used it to look at Stark's dick! This girl wastes no time! Also, according to Fern, Stark's got a tiny pee-pee. Sure, tell that to the dragon he soloed. That's some big dick energy! Okay, cast the spell I taught you, Fern, and tell me what you see. Okay. Oh. Why is it so small? Why is what small? My axe? I actually think it's pretty big for an axe. Oh dear, please don't start guessing. Fear of the unknown? My sense of pride? This tiny anthill in front of me? Wait, are you using your magic to look at my ding-dong? Mm. You are, aren't you? Is my ding-dong that small? What's small? I ship it. The trio heads out to the next town. And that's where we're going to leave our mages for now. Overall, Farron Beyond Journey's End is a unique, heartfelt story of loss, old wounds, healing, and what it means to move on. The story marries the highs of fantastical, impossible magic and all the powers that come with it, with the heartbreaking reality that all the magic in the world can't bring those you've lost back to you. In a way that few studios other than Ghibli do, it brings beauty to the mundane. It highlights things like the rising of a new sun and the joy of companionship, and it brings to life the moments other stories might exclude, all while delving into the tragedy that is internal life. If you want to see this series go on forever like I do, you'd better hit that subscribe button. I've been told it carries an ancient good luck charm that offers you a legendary bounty of more content. Until next time, safe travels, and screw you, Hider! I hope your ghost doesn't show up in heaven! You know what you did? This is Grim Jack, signing out. Yeah! <laughs>